I've got one last uh, uh, issue I want Milt to address, and then I hope some of you will uh, have a question or two, because we're going to get on to seeing some of his uh, images, and then uh, they're going to wail. So uh, I think uh, um, what I want to do to end up my part of it is by giving you a little bit of history, and then Milton will. Um, you have a question already? Uh, when did Milt Hinton start playing the bass? Uh, I stopped playing the violin first, July 18th, 1923. <laughs> I was 13 years old. How old are you, Mark? 10? Oh, man, you're way ahead of the game. Well, 19, uh, 1923, I was 13 years old, and my mother bought me a violin. My mother was an organist of a Baptist church and a really a wonderful musician. She was Nat Cole's piano teacher. I don't know what ever happened to me, but <laughs> this was a kind of, but she found out early that you couldn't teach your own children. And so she couldn't get, we always had a big fight, and when she told me, why can't you be nice like Nathaniel? That did it, you know, so <laughs> she knew she couldn't get through to me, so she found me out to a violin teacher, Professor James Johnson. And I was doing very well with that violin that night. By the time I was 16 years old, I was playing Milson's Concerto in E minor and doing very well. And that's when Al Jolson, 1929, Al Jolson made the first sound movie. Uh, the, uh, I think it was the jazz singer, I think was the name of it. And now in every neighborhood before that, every neighborhood, every theater had live music. You had at least a violin and a piano and a drum to play to the screen because there was no sound on the screen. And when Jolson made this first sound movie, they don't need musicians anymore. Everybody had a violin player and a piano player and a drummer. And the big theaters had a big orchestra. Now all of the theaters immediately stopped using violin players. And here I am just about ready to, to play. And I saw all of them, especially in my neighborhood, all the black violin players were out of work. Then a great, man, a great man, and I say a great man, many people don't like him too well, but his name was Al Capone. He, he, he opened up a cotton club in, in, in Chicago, in Cicero. And the cotton club was a big club where you used black entertainment and white customers. And he used all black entertainment, all black musicians and black dancers. And, and all of my friends in high school began to get jobs in the Al Capone's Cotton Club. And I was just ready to do this. I'm reading music, but I got the wrong instrument. They didn't even know violence in the jazz band. They had trumpets and all this, my friends. And they got these good jobs, and I was delivering newspapers for $9.25 $9 a week. I delivered 200 papers every morning. And I felt terrible, and Al Capone was, was like a Robin Hood. These guys had worked for him, he said, you want a car? He said, yes, sir. He said, go down there and tell the guy to give you a car. And they got cars and everything, and I got a paper sack on my back. And some of my friends would come by and see me deliver newspapers and say, hey, man, get a horn. And, and that's what I decided. I said, well, I got to do better than this. So I figured... A, a, a bass violin because of strings, four strings and four strings, and if you know, they turn them, the violin is turned, what tuned E A D G, and the bass is tuned G D A E, so they're just backwards. Fourths become fifths, and I, I was able to get into that kind of thing real fast, and I started playing and working with that. And one day, one of the great bass players got sick or got drunk or died, and somebody <laughs> said, "Well, get the kid," and I, and I got my first gig and. Uh, begin to work from there. So that's really how it started. That, that story and so many others are in Milton's book, Baseline. If you don't have a copy and you are literate, I, I really would uh, impress upon you to buy this book, uh, not just because Milt needs the money, but because it's really a very wonderful book about... Uh, about uh, jazz and the jazz life and how that life has uh, evolved over the past, how that culture, the jazz culture, has evolved over the past 50, 60 years and, and this man has lived those uh, 60 years so that what comes through in the book is a very, uh, is a sense of the present, a sense of his vitality and, and his experiences uh, as a, a human being as well as a wonderful uh, musician. So, uh, are there any questions? I'm going to forego my last one because we, we've got to get on with this program. Tony? Was it, was it, uh, was if Jimmy Blanton was a big influence on you. Yeah, I thought I was going to have to burn up my bass when Jimmy Blanton came along. 
he was the most influential musician in, in, in the history of jazz as far as the, the, the rhythm sections were concerned. And uh, Duke Ellington, I was already in Cab Calloway's band and doing very well. I guess it was 1939 when he joined uh, Duke, is that right? 1939, Duke Ellington had somebody down in St. Lucie find this young bass player named Jimmy Blando, a very handsome, tall young man, about 19, 20 years old, had fingers this long and played magnificently. And actually, Duke, all being a great, great musician, he wasn't always seeking new talent. Duke hired him and put him in his band. He, and Duke is known to never have fired anyone. Uh, he was the only one he ever even thought about firing was Charles Mingus. And he had, Charles Mingus had a fight, and he asked him, say, I think it would be better if you left. But he, he, he was that kind of man, he never wanted to fire anybody. So he hired Jimmy Bland in his band and kept his bass player, Billy Taylor, that was in the band. And Jimmy Bland played so well, this other bass player stood there and heard him, and he couldn't stand it. He just quit. He walked off the job. <laughs> and that's the way we all felt about him. Jimmy Bland was a wonderful young man that played very greatly and, and had all the humility of the things that are required of a bass player. And I'd like to talk about that some other time to you, about what for professional bass players was required of him and how Jimmy worked. I loved him very much. Anyone? Yes? No? Mark, did you? Yes? I have a question. When you came out of the round, what was your initial reaction to the players on the front of the jury? Were you receptive? Did you hear that? Over there? Did you hear the question? He wanted to know what was my effect or what was my feeling about bebop when it came along. Well, uh, it's sort of hard for me to explain that I didn't have any effect because I was young then. One time I was young, really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dizzy Gillespie had come in our band, and Dizzy was really, well, he's a father of bebop, as you probably know. And Dizzy came in the band, and I, I was always interested in practicing. I'm still doing that to this very day. People think I'm crazy, but I don't let a day go by without touching these acts some kind of way. And Dizzy came in the band, and he was very aggressive and tried. He, he didn't have it together. His chops were terrible. He, in fact, I, I remember we laugh about it. I had to load him because I was already in Cap Calloway's band making a hundred bucks a week. And in 1936, that was a lot of money, man. And Dizzy came in broke and I had to load him five dollars to get his mouthpiece plated to keep it from going right through his lip. And so on the intermissions at the Cotton Club, Dizzy and I used to go up on the roof and, and practice. And Dizzy would show me some some new licks and how to play. And then every night when we got through at 4 o'clock in the morning, we would walk from 48th and Broadway down to 116th Street and 7th Avenue to a place called Minton's, where everybody jammed when they got off. And, and so I was in on the working out of this sort of thing. I was very glad it was a new innovation. And when we got on the Minton's, there'd be a lot of kids in there with their horns. They wanted to play with Dizzy and Milt and, and Bird and all of us, Monk. We'd all be there, Philly Joe Jones playing. And these kids would grab their horns. They'd come in and were a drag to us. So Dizzy, being as smart as he was, we would go up on top of the cotton club. He says, let's work out some new changes. And he knew all these new changes. We'd, we'd go around the horn, you know, be that. E flat, A flat, D flat, and, and make up some tune, you know. And we have it all together when we get on to the to mittens in the morning. The kids say, what you guys going to play? You know, and they already we say, we're going to play I Got Rhythm. And they go through the ordinary changes, and we were nowhere near there. <laughs> and they had, to, they had to put their horns down and leave. And that's really some of the things the way Bebop got started. <laughs> As you can see, it was very collegial. Uh, <laughs> Any, anything else? Uh, if not, then um, Milton's going to take it on as a solo, um, and he's going to show his uh, images, and uh, then we'll have some music. So thank you very much, and yeah. Milton, it's all yours. Yeah. Well, thank you. Herb Schnitzer, please, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the, the city of Newton, I would like to present you with a key to the city. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I have another presentation. Um, I first, I guess I'd like to say a, briefly on behalf of myself, I have the opportunity sometimes to make uh, deliveries on behalf of 
the mayor, um, and uh, oftentimes I don't find it as interesting, and I do think that this evening has been quite fascinating. Uh, I particularly was struck by what I think is true, that you said that music, uh, you can't play music when you're angry. Um, and I think that we could use more people like Milton in the world. I'd like to see, like to see you. I'm glad to see you traveling all around. But without, without further ado, let me read this resolution. Whereas Milt Hinton is an honored guest in the city of Newton, and we appreciate the co-sponsorship of Highland Jazz and Boston College, which has resulted in his appearance here tonight. And whereas, as musician, photographer, and historian, Milt Hinton, alias the judge, is renowned <laughs> throughout the world as the Renaissance man of jazz, and whereas Milt Hinton, in his performing career of nearly six decades, including work with many other legendary artists and celebrities of the jazz world, has become known as the Dean of Jazz Basis. And whereas, in all his varied roles, performing and visual artist, raconteur, which we've heard, and historian, Milt Hinton extends our understanding of the tradition of jazz in American culture. And now, there, now therefore, be it resolved, that the mayor of the city of Newton does hereby proudly proclaim Saturday, March the 23rd, 1991, as Milt Hinton Day. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Everybody has a day. This is it. Thank you so very much. We're going to play something for you. I'd just like to say I've been, I've been so blessed to be spared so many years of seeing so many generations of young musicians, and it's a great joy. I'm eternally grateful. Just recently, I was in the music store in New York, Sam Goodies, and some young kids were in there buying some records, and one kid said to the other one, hey, let's get this record. Milt Hinton's on it. And the other kid said, now wait a minute, you've got to be careful. There's two Milt Hinton. There's an old guy who used to make records years ago <laughs> named Milt. And there's a guy making records now named Milt Hinton. So now the guy's a musician say, am I the old Milt Hinton or the new Milt Hinton? <laughs> so thank you. We're going to play a little something for you. Thank you. And as I always say in my program, support live jazz. Support jazz on the radio too, but live jazz is the most important. Here's the, hold on, I ask you one question. How did you get the name of the judge? Are you a fair judge or a hanging judge? A musical judge. A musical judge. Yeah. With Ray Santisi on the piano, with both hands. Yeah. And on drums, a fellow I gave a nickname to many years ago, Sticks, Alan Dawson. <laughs> 